There was, there was someone who had lived a hard life, quite challenging. A life that was kind of marked with violence both towards her and others. But some, suddenly she finds herself pregnant. And this pregnancy has changed everything for her. This new life gestating in her womb causes this lady to reconsider the life that she had been living. And so she vows that she's going to leave that former life behind. And all of the messiness and violence and then settle down with her fiancé. On the day of the wedding rehearsal, the bride, who's now visibly pregnant, uh, is there with the rest of the wedding party. But the actual father of the unborn baby, who is not her fiancé, ambushes and murders the entire wedding party, leaving the pregnant bride in a coma. For four years, she remains in this coma, waking suddenly in a hospital and realizes that she's no longer pregnant. Believing her unborn child had died in the aftermath of the fighting, she vows to track down and kill every single person who was, in, who was part of that wedding massacre and the death of her child. So she makes a list, one by one. She tracks them down and murders the key players of this wedding ambush until she comes to the father of the child, the mastermind behind the ambush. And unbeknownst to her, her baby had survived and had been raised by the father. The bride, in a final moment of revenge, kills the father and leaves with her child, finally free of her past. Well, this is actually a fictional story of revenge of extreme proportions as portrayed through Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill movies, if you're familiar with those movies. But there's something about stories like this that resonate with us, don't they? They tell a tale about someone who has been wronged. And they, it taps into our gut desire of injustice and wanting to make things right. And for someone who's usually the person who was wrong to be the one who goes and does it. We know this in a smaller sense in our own way, right? It's the friend that betrayed your trust and told your secret in front of the whole class. It's the partner that cheated on you and ruined your relationship. It's the coworker who threw you under the bus in front of your supervisor, you know, stymieing your advancement and them getting the promotion. It's the business partner that made secret deals that cut you out of the company. It's the best friend that betrayed you with a kiss. And we might not go, you know, all kill Bill on the perpetrator, but I suspect that deep down inside, when there is that violation, a lot of us know that that there is someone out there we would like to get even with. And perhaps if we had a little bit more courage or a bit more folly, we might actually go through with it. This desire for revenge is like a deep itch in our souls and newspapers and artists and movie makers and novelists know that if we can't scratch our own itch for revenge, we like reading and watching and hearing stories of others who did and could. So let's have another peek at that passage that was read for us today as we conclude this Romans chapter 12 uh, series. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live at harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil with evil. Uh, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
And while there's many facets of this passage that we could dive into, because it's a big list that Paul has given us in this letter to Romans about these imperatives of things we need to do, I want us to examine the believer's response to those who hurt us, to our response to our enemies, to our foes. And what comes to mind for you as those, those words are written? For some, it's like a balm to the soul, an assurance that one day God will repay. For others, it might be quite upsetting. This feels really soft. It feels passive. And it even feels like we're letting the bad guys get away with harming people and we're not doing anything to stop it. Yet, Scripture seems to emphasize that revenge is essentially ruled out for the transformed person. The transformed person who is marked by grace. And Kill Bill would not make a good movie if the bride were not to go get revenge, but to treat Bill with kindness and respect and grace. The Count of Monte Cristo would be far less of a stimulating story if Dante were to go and bless those who wrongly imprisoned him. And Inigo Montoya would be a pretty dull character if he were to go and seek out the six-fingered man to make him a meal and serve him a drink. You killed my father. Prepare for a seven-course meal. To let people get away with hurting others rubs us against our God-given desire for justice, to see wrongs made right, and to have people pay a penalty for the crime that they have committed. We want to see justice prevail, and yet we're face-to-face with this imperative black and white in Scripture, not just to avoid revenge, but to bless those who damage and hurt us. That's much easier said than done, if we're honest. Saying that we shouldn't take revenge is not a way of saying that evil isn't real, or that what was done to you really didn't hurt at all, or that it doesn't matter. Evil is real. It often does hurt, and it does matter. We believe that the world is created by God to be good and that everything that distorts and, dist- and, uh, and damages it and spoils that creation is in fact evil. But the question is, and what are we going to do about it? We want people to stand up and say, this is what we're going to do about it. But because we're jumping into Paul's letter, near the end, we've missed some of the context That was leading up to chapter 12. Because remember, chapter 12 starts with a therefore, which means he has been building this whole letter with a therefore that pivots. And so we've jumped in and and missed a bit of that stuff. For Paul, the issue is not what are we going to do about it. Rather, it is what has Jesus already done about it. And he has devoted a significant portion of his letter to the Romans addressing this question. And for Paul, it boils down to what he writes in Romans chapter 5. We're going to jump to chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you can go there. Romans 5, verses 6 to 11. And this is Paul's like big, big piece of the letter here. He says, For you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When human evil reached its height, God came and took the full weight of that sin upon himself through Jesus. 
Because Jesus took his, our sin on himself and bore the punishment that we deserved, he was able to make way for a new creation and a new way of living to be brought in. Paul is only able to write that we're not to enact revenge on people who wrong us because we are the recipients of God's grace through Jesus who has taken the punishment that we deserve. When people sin against you through betrayal, through assault, through lying, through slander, through violence, in whatever way it might be, your natural, my natural inclination is to punish them for that transgression. Make them pay. You demand justice from the situation. But your sin against the holy God lands the same way. There is a debt against God that your sin and my sin has caused. And because God is a just God, a punishment must take place. If there's no punishment for sin, then there is no justice. And we believe that we serve a just God. Justice is woven all through the scriptures in the Old and the New Testament. However, we worship a God who is not just just. He is also compassionate, full of mercy and grace. And through Jesus, God took the punishment that we deserve and paid the price of death, even death on a cross, even though Jesus was sinless and innocent. Jesus demonstrated what not taking revenge looks like. And instead of vengeance against us, he demonstrated love through or love to us who were still actively his enemies. Even when Jesus was being nailed to the cross, he was actively being murdered by the Romans' authorities. Jesus' prayer for them was one of mercy and compassion. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. God's act of love through Jesus' obedience on the cross puts to death the cycle of offense and revenge between humanity and God. Jesus, once and for all, has paid the price for your sin, your past, your present, your future sin. He has made peace between you and God, and this is the good news. You don't got to do anything to make it right. It's already been done. Jesus has already acted, and he has offered you grace and forgiveness. And so for Paul, writing to Christians, those who have received that forgiveness, who have been born again, who have been raised to new life, who are new creations, he urged them, do not take revenge, my dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath. It's written. It's mine to revenge, I will repay. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you heap burning coals on his head. Don't, become over, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul knows that, the, that revenge is not the answer to being wronged. Even as good as it might feel to make that person pay for what they have done. When this is, when this like, and in this we're talking on like a, a personal level. When someone has wronged you, there is that desire to go and make them feel the same pain that they caused you to feel. And we think it will give us a bit of joy, peace. But revenge only perpetrates evil. And you know this instinctively whether it's in your family with your sibling. He hit me, so I hit him back. Well, she did this, and she said that, so I did this. You even, as you grow up as adults, you still have siblings who fight about this kind of stuff, and it gets out of control. You know it with your spouse. When your spouse does something wrong, and you come in with a passive-aggressive comment, and that puts them on their heels, and so they come back with something else, and you just know this is, it just kind of keeps on going. You know it with your coworkers. You know it with your neighbors, the people who you just like you live in proximity with. If you just keep taking revenge on one another, the cycle just grows and grows and grows. 
It happens with tribes and nations, and both sides are always able to justify their actions against the person who has perpetrated against them, who has wronged them. They will always justify these further atrocities because they themselves have been wronged. But for for Paul, because the Christian has been the recipient of grace, something that they did not deserve, their sin has been met not with revenge, but with love. He expects that a transformed life would lead Christians to rid themselves from revenge and instead model love towards their enemies. If your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you heap burning coals on their head. Paul writes that we should not, that we should actually go out of our way to do something positive. That we should actually do uncalled acts of service and kindness to those who have wronged us. And it's our actions of love and kindness that might actually lead our enemies towards repentance and remorse for their actions. This is what Paul's referring to with the burning coals on his head. I remember when I was younger that I thought if I was just kind to them, that was an even better way of getting back at them. I was trying to view it as like, oh, I could just like burn them with coals of kindness. But then I realized, no, I should actually love them. And they are in a spot where kindness actually does something to them. It'll, it, it, uh, your enemy wants to elicit a response from you. And if you respond in love and kindness, it disarms them and frustrates them. And that's crazy, you might think. How could someone, how could me showing kindness to the person who wronged me do anything but condone their actions, right? We got to take a hard line on this. Because if I show any kind of compassion towards them, all I am telling them is this kind of behavior is okay. You can keep doing it, right? Well, If we had been reading this whole letter from the beginning, Paul would have covered this already very early on. In uh, Romans chapter 2, I think is the reference there, he says, uh, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience? Not realizing that it is God's kindness that is intended to leave you to repentance. God's kindness towards you leads you to repentance. Not God's revenge against you leads you to repentance. Not God's, you know, guilt trip towards you leads you to repentance. Not God getting back at you, paying you back what you deserve that leads you to repentance. No, it's God's kindness that leads you to repentance. That he has, he responds in in love and kindness towards our sin. And that does something in it that calls to us that we come and we repent. This is good news. And we can think that it is our duty to bring repentance through violence, through threats, through eye for an eye of retaliation. Yet kindness is what's able to undermine the cycle of revenge and violence. When we started this short series, we talked about how our bodies are living sacrifices to God. A response for what he has done for us. That in view of his grace towards us, our response is to use our bodies, our relationships, our time, our energy, our connections in the world to serve him and others. We talked about how our bodies are not ours. They belong to God as a living sacrifice to him. So we don't get to say, this is my body. It says, no, 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 our body is a sacrifice. It belongs to God. We also say that our bodies, we found out that our bodies also belong to one another in the church as we serve them, as we use our gifts for one another, as we, we go out of our way to care for one another and that big list of imperatives And then we also see here that our bodies are not our own. They belong to our enemies. They belong to our enemies in love. 
And the implications are that as Christians, we ought to be really, really, really difficult to offend. A mature believer is almost impossible to offend. A mature believer is one who does not take offense and then respond. That it does not matter what people do to us and how they insult us or insult our faith. Our response towards them is one of love and kindness. A person who is easily offended will often respond in vengeance, respond in anger, respond in revenge, respond in pettiness. But someone who's difficult to offend knows that their body is already given to God as a sacrifice. And whatever people do to you, they can't take anything from you. In fact, if they were to even take our mortal bodies, that that's okay too, because we've already died. We have died along with Christ so that we can be raised and so we don't have anything to fear, which means we can love people without fear. And that is powerful. N.T. Wright in his commentary on Romans writes this. He says, Christians are to be known as good neighbors prepared to join in with the fun when someone on the street has good news and they're there to support and to weep alongside those who face tragedy. It is within that kind of setting where Christians are known, liked, and respected. That's a lot of work there. Known, liked, and respected that people will be prepared to listen to them talk about the Lord that they serve. The one who seemed to let evil conquer him when he died on the cross, but who in fact overcame it with the power of his own love and life. How we respond when people treat us ill and when we respond in love and kindness is a demonstration of the God that we serve. And when we're doing all the other stuff, when we realize our body is not ours, it belongs to others, and we're there and we're known, which means you have to have relationships with people, and that you're liked, which means you're not being a jerk, and that you're respected, which means that you follow through on the things that you say you're going to do, and your life reflects the things that you profess. When you do all that stuff, people lean in and say, how on earth are you treating someone who has wronged you in such a way? Tell me more. That's a power I can't tap into. And you realize, well, it's actually nothing that I've already done. It's what God has already done. And so I don't have to do anything. I'm actually free to do it. I'm able to live into this new reality. Christ has done the hard work and now he invites us to come and to join him in it. And as we go from this place, perhaps there are people who have come to mind that have wronged you. And you realize that your response has been revenge. What would loving them look like? What would showing kindness in response to insult look like? If this is a new thing that we haven't done or lived into, it might actually be pretty challenging. It might feel pretty vulnerable. Like you're putting yourself out there to get hit again. Yeah, you are. (laughs) But our Savior has already done it. And he shows us that he can do it. Perhaps there are maybe social media posts you've made about people and others that you need to remove and take down and reconcile because you realize your words were used as a weapon to enact some revenge, maybe even passive aggressively, against someone. And it doesn't reflect the love that God has shown you. And in this, the hope for justice remains. And we don't want to let evil continue to rule in our world. And we want someone to hold them accountable. Absolutely. But when we have been the ones who have been wronged, we know that our view of justice is not a good objective view of justice. Because we've been wronged, we want to turn that knife just a little bit more in them. That's why you don't have judges who preside over cases in which they have a beef with the offender, right? You need an impartial judge who can do this. We have a bad way of viewing it. However, we also have a God who is perfect in justice. 
And we do actually look forward to the day when he will make things right. And there will be an opportunity for that to happen. And we also serve a just God who is gracious and compassionate, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to knowledge of him. And so we sometimes have to wait. And like we see in the book of Revelation, we might be crying out, how long, O oh Lord, is this going to happen? But we have to trust in God's sovereignty and follow in our Lord's leading so that our lives are transformed and so we are free to love those in our world. And thankfully, we are promised that when Jesus does return, there will be an account for evil in this world. There will be a judgment from a perfect judge, a just judge, a compassionate judge. And until then, we get to live in his grace with a chance for repentance and, re re repentance and reconciliation to God and to one another. As we move forward, heading into this Advent season and beyond, as we look forward to what God is preparing for us, let's continue to be a church that is so difficult to offend, to be a people that are so difficult to offend, to carry on the ministry of reconciliation that God has started with us individually and then with one another collectively and with the world, that we might be overflowing with love and grace to all especially those who have wronged us. I'm going to close this in prayer. I invite the worship team up as I pray as well. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we just are so grateful that you have responded in love and compassion towards us. That while we were still sinners, while we were still actively fighting against it, you would come to take on our sin and our punishment. That you would offer us new life through your Son that you would give us your Holy Spirit to empower us, to convict us of sin and righteousness. And we just acknowledge there's been so many times we've taken for granted your grace and we repent of that. Holy Spirit, continue to fill us. May we be a people that is so hard to offend because we are so rooted in your love for us. Work in us, transform us, we pray. For your glory, we pray this, Jesus, and in your name. Amen.